Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, author of Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, former surgeon, scientific researcher, and clinician at the Cleveland Clinic, featured in documentaries such as Forks Over Knives and What the Health, initially specialized in endocrine surgeries of the thyroid, parathyroid, and brush during his practice, and eventually transitioned his research to cardiology. While Dr. Esselstyn was a chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force, he began questioning the efficacy of mechanical intervention with respect to the prevention of disease in future patients and its direct addressal of the causation of illness. As a result, Dr. Esselstyn initiated comprehensive global study and research on diseases including breast cancer, prostate cancer, and cardiovascular disease. In 1991, Dr. Esselstyn was the president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons and held the first national conference on the elimination and prevention of heart disease, in which he has spoken alongside Dr. Colin Campbell, who has authored The China Study. Throughout Dr. Esselstyn's 20-year study in which patients with severe heart disease were advised to comply with a plant-based, oil-free diet, the patient's results were astonishing and are shared in the book Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, which I actually have here as well. Um, Dr. Esselstyn managed to gain extensive evidence on the relationship between nutrition and the halt and even reversal of cardiovascular disease. He served as a combat surgeon during the Vietnam War and became the first recipient of the Benjamin Spock Award. So my first question for you is, what were your discoveries during the 20-year study you conducted to assess the connection between nutrition and cardiovascular disease? And this is sort of embarrassing for the medical profession to realize that we have known for 90 or 100 years that there are multiple cultures on the planet Earth mm -hmm. where cardiovascular disease is virtually non-existent. And uh, the reason for that is uh, pretty straightforward. It's they eat whole food, plant-based nutrition without oil. Uh, it couldn't be more straightforward or simpler than that. But what we have done, and almost uh, ashamedly, is we've tried to take this disease and treat it with mechanically, mm -hmm. uh, with stents or with bypass surgery, or we treat it with symptoms with drugs. Mm -hmm. None of the drugs None of the stents, none of the bypass surgery has one single solitary thing whatsoever to do with the causation of the illness. Mm -hmm. And I think that numerous research studies now that have been published in the peer-reviewed literature indicate that clearly when you give patients the time and the understanding of the science, they can be empowered mm -hmm. themselves by changing their lifestyle to be the locus of control to halt and reverse their disease. When you made the shift in your nutritional recommendations, besides the great success the patients had in your study, what kind of reactions did you experience by your fellow colleagues or others in the medical field? Well, again, that depends on who your colleagues are. If we look at the truth of the matter is I am an enormous threat <laughs> to, to medicine's biggest cash cow. <laughs> because when you find that there are study after study after study, Orbita in the United Kingdom, ischemia in this study, excuse me, in this country, and the Courage study in this country, mm -hmm. all of which clearly show that really a patient's aggressive lifestyle that they complete with can eliminate disease progression. And we often will see evidence of traumatic disease reversal, mm -hmm. uh, all at the hands of, uh, of a patient, not, not with drugs, not with stents, not with bypasses. I also know that you talk a lot about oil specifically compared to other plant-based doctors. Uh, in chapter 10 entitled Why Can't I Have Heart Healthy Oils, you discuss the effects of oils on cholesterol levels, blood sugar levels, and ultimately the coronary arteries while mentioning the Leon Diet Heart Study. It seems apparent that the media took the aspect of oil from the Leon Diet Heart Study uh, and blew it out of proportion to be the reason for healthfulness and longevity in the Mediterranean. That happens, doesn't it? Yeah, that happens. <laughs> that just a little bit can't hurt or everything is fine in moderation. How would you explain the impact of oils on cardiovascular health? Well, I wrote a, a paper that was published in the peer-reviewed scientific journal, uh, the, the International Journal of Disease Reversal and prevention and the title of the article that i wrote for them was is oil healthy mm -hmm. and i review the animal studies on oil the human studies on oil showing how oil injures the endothelial cells mm -hmm. you see all experts would agree that it is the endothelial cell that is where this disease is, has its inception 
its onset, its beginning. That is by every time we eat the Western diet, we further punish, injure, compromise, and turn our endothelial system into a train wreck because the endothelial system manufactures a truly magic molecule of gas, nitric oxide. And it is nitric oxide that is responsible for the salvation protection of all of our blood vessels because of its remarkable functions. For example, nitric oxide will prevent all the, st all the elements within our blood flow from becoming sticky. It keeps things from, it's, well, it's more like, uh, more like uh, not like Velcro, it's more like tef Teflon. <laughs> nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate, that's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide is, will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thick and stiff or inflamed, protect us from getting high blood pressure or hypertension. Number four, number four is the absolute key. A safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from ever developing any blockages or plaque. So literally everybody on the planet Earth who has cardiovascular disease has their disease because in the previous decades they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised and turned their endothelial system into an absolute train wreck. They no longer have enough nitric oxide to protect themselves from making blockages or plaque. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that this is not a malignancy. This is a completely benign foodborne illness. And once you can get patients to understand that never, never, ever again are they to pass through their lips a single morsel that is going to further injure an already train wrecked endothelium. Yeah. And the endothelium begins to recover, makes enough nitric oxide so we can not only halt disease progression, but we often see elements of disease reversing. You mentioned the reason for the absence of cardiovascular disease in Okinawans, Papua Highlanders of New Guinea, uh, rural Chinese, Central Africans, and the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico is due to their whole food, plant-based way of eating. Why is it critical to analyze epidemiology when speaking of nutrition and what should the Western world take away from these findings? Well, uh, the reason, I think it's pretty obvious that do you want to study a country where cardiovascular disease is virtually non-existent? And then you've got the answer of why this disease is developed. For example, what happens to the Okinawans, the rural Chinese, Central Africans, the Tarahumara, or the Papua Highlanders, when they leave their country and they move to, to the West, they move to the United States, mm -hmm. what happens to their arteries? They become diseased. So that kind of goes against the notion that it's genetically caused. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's 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 the, the favorite excuse <clears throat> when a patient says, well, you know, my father had this disease, my grandfather had this disease, his brothers, my uncles had this disease. Yeah, they all ate the same Western diet. Mm -hmm. What is your response to those who are still not convinced that heart disease is a foodborne illness? They have to become educated. They have to read the literature that has been published, read, become aware of the science. So as outlined in the um, page 75 of your book, although the cholesterol levels of patients in a study reported by the New England Journal of Medicine were reduced uh, below 150 um, milligrams deciliters by statin drugs, the levels which you recommend through your nutritional plan, the patients still had cardiovascular disease and some even died, and I quote from the book, within 30 months. Can you perhaps elaborate on why numerical measurements may not be the sole focus in the monitoring of cardiovascular disease prevention, progression, and reversal in some cases? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, the truth be known, you know, it's no number has ever caused heart disease. Heart disease is caused by what is passing through your lips every day that has the capacity to injure your endothelial cells. So even patients who have a cholesterol of 160, 180, 190, or 200, who never, 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 never pass through their lips a single morsel that injures their endothelial cells, in, they in essence are building themselves an endothelial fortress. Mm -hmm. So even if you have a few extra molecules of cholesterol passing through your lips, mm -hmm. excuse me, 
few extra molecules of cholesterol passing through your blood vessels, mm -hmm. they cannot injure the endothelium or start to build plaque because you have built an endothelial fortress. The problem with artificially lowering your cholesterol with a drug, and you're still eating the foods that every time they pass your lips, you're gonna further injure the endothelial cells and make more plaque. That doesn't work. Right. It's not the number, it's the, it's the food. In other words, you can have a cholesterol of 140 or 120. Mm -hmm. If you're eating chilled French fries and hamburgers and pizza and cheeseburgers, I don't care what you, you know, you're still injuring your blood vessels. Right. It's just yeah. interesting how you can achieve the same, for example, cholesterol level with statin drugs and a plant-based diet, but the effects are so different, even though the, the number might be the same. I find that interesting. Wait for the sales of statins, but look, statins have been around for what, over 25 years. They came on when cardiovascular disease was the number one killer of women and men. That was 25 years ago. What is still the number one killer of women and men? Heart disease. Heart disease, yeah. For instance, all those nations that don't have, ever have heart disease is not because, I mean, how many statins are they taking in Okinawa, rural China, Central Africa, the Papua Highlands, and the Tarahumara? No. <laughs> it's because <laughs> they aren't eating the foods that decimate and destroy their arteries. Throughout your practice and in the book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, you mentioned multiple times, and I know you already talked about this, uh, the importance of the endothelial cells and the presence of nitric oxide to aid in the restoration of compromised vascular systems. Exactly how critical are the endothelial cells for the prevention and potential reversal of cardiovascular disease? Can you explain some of the biochemistry involving nitric oxide production? Nitric oxide is produced by the endothelial cell. So if you have healthy, healthy endothelial cells, you have healthy nitric oxide. The endothelial production of nitric oxide is age dependent. For example, you, you never heard of a boy or girl at age eight having a heart attack. No, they have nitric oxide coming out of their ears, <laughs> right? By the time you're 50, even if you are beautifully healthy, you now have 50% of the endothelial production of nitric oxide that you had when you were 25. By the time you're 80, you've lost 70%. So what we have done in the last 10 years, last decade, the patients with heart disease, we've introduced a component in their care that directly addresses how we can stimulate the endothelial cell for more nitric oxide production. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we have taken advantage of the new research within the last 12 years that has indicated that mankind has an alternate pathway for making more nitric oxide. If I can get patients with heart disease to chew six times a day, a green leafy vegetable roughly the size of half of their fist after it has first been boiled in water or steamed five and a half to six minutes so it's now nice and tender, then they must anoint it with several drops of a delightful either rice vinegar or balsamic vinegar. Why? Because research has shown us that the acetic acid from those vinegars is able to stimulate the endothelial synthase enzyme contained within the endothelial cell that is responsible for making nitric oxide. So we're going to get them to chew this green leafy vegetable alongside their breakfast cereal again as a mid-morning snack, again with their luncheon sandwich, that's three, mm -hmm. but afternoon or dinner time, five, and of course I adore it, when they have that evening snack of kale. The second benefit is when you are eating the grains, you are stimulating the bone marrow to once again make the endothelial progenitor cell. What does that do? The endothelial progenitor cell will replace our senescent injured worn out endothelial cells. The third and most important function of all, when you're chewing that green, you are chewing a green nitrate. As you chew the green nitrate, it is going to mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that normally reside in the crypts and grooves of your tongue. Those bacteria are going to reduce that nitrate that you are chewing to a nitrite. And once you swallow the nitrite, it is now your own gastric acid, which is going to further reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide, which can enter your nitric oxide pool. 
So think about it. What you're doing for minimal expense, no hideous side effects. <laughs> Literally, all day long, you are absolutely restoring nitric oxide, the very molecule, the deficiency of which gave you this disease in the first place. Now there is a caveat to this. Toothpaste with fluoride, public drinking water with fluoride, or mouthwash, those will injure the beneficial bacteria in your mouth. And we do not like patients to take antacids if they don't have to, because antacids will reduce your gastric acidity and you will not be able to reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide. In the book, you note that the gradual progress, uh, progressive narrowing of a coronary artery only accounts for about 12% of heart attacks, whereas the clotting response um, of the body to the fat deposits leaching into the bloodstream caused by plaque ruptures is responsible for nearly 90% of heart attacks. Uh, what right. may cause a plaque to abruptly rupture and why is myocardial infarction caused by the body's clotting response more prevalent? When these plaques in your artery are young, and they're forming and they're filled with a lot of inflammation, fat and cholesterol. There is also a cell that is in that called uh, the foam cell. And the foam cell manufactures these nasty molecules that we call metalloproteinases. Those metalloproteinases that are secreted by the foam cell will progressively thin the cap over the plaque. Uh, a plaque is blocking the artery by, let's say, 50%. Now what happens is those metalloproteinases, as they erode the cap over the plaque, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And now the sheer force of blood racing over that cap, over the plaque, that is in the cap which is now so thin, it ruptures the cap. So now what we have is a plaque rupture. And there is the oozing out of, if you will, or the extravasation of plaque content into the flowing blood. That activates our clotting factors. So suddenly, within minutes of rupturing the cap over that plaque, now a clot begins to form at the point of rupture. And the clot formation is self-propagating. So within a matter of further minutes, somebody that had absolutely no symptoms, which you won't get from 50% block, no symptoms, now they go to suddenly. The entire artery is suddenly totally blocked and all the downstream heart muscle now is immediately deprived of its oxygen and nutrients and it starts to die and that's 90 percent of your heart attack have you ever heard of somebody who, who said well uncle joe was never sick a day in his life and he dropped over dead yes. when he had a heart attack because he had ruptured the back in his artery there's a general consensus in relation to saturated fats, cholesterol, and uh, coronary artery disease. However, avoidance of avocado, nuts, um, and the complete elimination of oil tends to catch people off guard as it's not a widely accepted concept. To clarify some of the confusion surrounding avocados, nuts, and oils, why should oils be off limits and why are monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fats harmful? Well, there are multiple study studies that show clearly that saturated fats encourage your liver to make more of your LDL cholesterol. And of course, that's going to be uh, an important factor in developing your heart disease. The oil is really quite clear. And I mentioned that I wrote a paper that was published in the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention. And the title of the article that I wrote was, Is Oil Healthy? And that's where I review all the animal studies and all the human studies indicating how oil injures the endothelial so now, and a good example of that would be a study of uh, Robert Vogel, chairman of cardiology at the University of Maryland. When he took a, a group of healthy young subjects, divided them in half, they went to a, a certain fast food restaurant characterized by arches, which are golden. Half of the group got the cornflakes. And when they did the brachial artery tourniquet test for endothelial function, it was normal after the cornflakes. The other half of the group ate hash browns and sausage. Within 120 minutes after that meal, they were unable to dilate the artery. That single meal had so trashed, so injured, so compromised their ability to make nitric oxide, they couldn't dilate the artery. Now, as far as nuts goes, I will agree I'm an out, a bit of an outlier on this one. First of all, nuts are just absolutely loaded 
with saturated fat. And nuts are highly addicting. If I said it was okay to have three nuts, that's not what people would hear. If Dr. Esselstyn said nuts are okay, that means they're going to be in the glove compartment. They'll be in the bathroom, the kitchen, the bedroom, the hallway, the living room. Nuts are highly addicting. And also, I have yet to see a single study where you take patients who are seriously ill with cardiovascular disease and include nuts in that package and have them arrest and reverse their disease. This does not exist in the lab that I can see. And also, at the present time, we will compete our results of halting and reversing disease with anybody on the planet Earth. Granted, maybe nobody else is as mean as I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been told I'm not as mean as I look. No, not at all. But I hate uh, I hate failure. I want the patients to succeed, and the same thing is true of, of avocado. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of saturated fat in the avocado. If I was to take uh, our dietary approach over to Okinawa, you know what they'd say? <laughs> well, you guys finally got it right. We've been doing this for 500 years. <laughs> Your commitment and integrity to base your beliefs um, on the scientific data rather than preconceived notions surrounding nutrition and disease is incredibly admirable since you previously mentioned that you grew up on a farm and consumed the typical American diet, uh, which you now refer to as draconian. If that's not the ultimate representation of breaking stereotypes, I really don't know what is. At what point would you say the evidence was profound enough for you to make a paradigm shift in your views and medical approach? Well. To be honestly truthful, uh, I started the program with a, because I was still actively involved with a surgeon. I started the program in 1985. It was really a group of wonderful, cooperative, and dedicated male, mostly male patients, because that's simply the way that patients came. On our second study, we had plenty of women involved in the study. But in this first uh, study, it was really quite a, apparent. But within a year, within actually, yeah, it was around 15 months after we started the study, one of the patients who had entered probably about 10 or 10 months earlier, he had a lot of heart disease, but in addition, he also had a lot of claudication in his right calf muscle pain because after he walked uh, 30 or 40 yards, because he had a partially blocked artery in his thigh, his calf muscle would sort of run out of blood and he'd have to stop and wait and rest and then when it filled up, he'd go again. I was so focused on his uh, on his heart that I kind of forgot all about his leg. And well, it was about 10 months into the, his program, he said to me one day, Dr. Esselstyn, do you recall when I first started seeing you, I had to stop crossing the skyway to your office five times because of pain uh, in my right calf. He said, you know, in the last month, the pain has disappeared. I don't stop. And the exciting thing was, fortunately, at baseline, which was that when he, we first saw him, we did a measurement of his pulse volume at the ankle of his right foot, and not surprisingly, it was markedly diminished because of the blockage in the artery in his thigh. Mm -hmm. However, we then repeated the pulse, pulse volume and compared it to the one that we had at the onset, it had doubled. Wow. So here we had absolutely rock solid, clear, unrefutable scientific evidence that food and food alone could reverse heart disease. And somebody's going to say, well, wait a minute. What about the statin drugs? <laughs> well, my answer was quite clear. In 1986, there were no statin drugs. And we have found since then, time and time again, that patients who are willing to 100% follow the program the statin drugs, which in many cases have given them so many side effects that they couldn't continue. Those patients still can do beautifully. In regards to following a whole foods plant-based lifestyle in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, I've heard you mention the potential ability of nitric oxide mitigating the effects of COVID-19. Um, although there may not be sufficient research, evidence, or analysis of this correlation, uh, do you have any thoughts on the relationship between nitric oxide and coronavirus? Are you hopeful that as a result of this virus, which has been shown to have a zoonotic origin, people will start to change their eating habits? Well, if they understand the research, it may help. But uh, where this, I think, has its onset is in the first coronavirus, number one. There was some uh, early evidence that nitric oxide could be toxic to this virus. Uh, a group of researchers, maybe it was in April or May of 2020, 
that it's my understanding that they initiated two interesting studies with nitric oxide. They began giving nitric oxide inhalation for 30 minutes to patients who came in newly diagnosed with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, for their healthcare workers, they gave them the 30 minutes of inhalation when they came to work and 30 minutes of, of inhalation of nitric oxide when they left work. Now, I have not seen those studies published yet. However, my contacts with some, some people from the Mass General who are not involved in the study said that they have heard that it was promising. Remember that where this virus enters our body, it doesn't come in through our hands or through our legs. It comes in through the That's nose. Really and the nose is beautifully laden with a lot of endothelial cells and makes a fair amount of nitric oxide. So theoretically, when somebody is eating whole food plant-based nutrition, the virus tries to enter and it encounters a lot of nitric oxide that is being manufactured, then it's going to find a, a, a tough road to hold to try to get to this patient if they're if they have a strong initial defense. What do you think people should take away ultimately? And this is my last question uh, from the COVID nineteen pandemic. Considering the scientific evidence there is to prove that industrialized farming has been shown to be a breeding ground for viruses such as um, the virus that causes COVID nineteen. I think it's important to try to get a lot more research into where these viruses have their origin. And it all may ultimately mean that we're going to have to be so sophisticated with our vaccines that as they become better and better and safe and, safe and more powerful, I don't know if you were old enough to remember infantile paralysis or polio, because when I was young, this was rampant. Mm -hmm. And you, often when people successfully survive, it would leave them absolutely paralyzed. Like, for example, the President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, president in the 1930s and early 40s, uh, was completely paralyzed from the waist down, but, but he went on to a career in, in politi as a politician. But the point is that, and I, and I had many people and sometimes friends who I had that were totally paralyzed uh, one yeah. extremity by the uh, by infantile paralysis. And guess what? You don't know of that disease. It's gone. Everybody got sufficiently vaccinated in a way, in a way that was shock and saving, worked out the vaccine. It was very safe, very effective. And really it's almost been eradicated mm -hmm. in those parts of the world, except where for some reason they don't permit that vaccination. The other thing that we destroyed with vaccination was smallpox. I mean, that used to absolutely destroy, you know, thousands of people. That's now been also eradicated. So but from a, life, a lifestyle standpoint, I, yes, I think we have to get smart enough about how we deal with livestock. Because mm -hmm. remember, I grew up on an average Angus in a beef farm. And little did I know at that age that we were raising products that were destroying people's health. What is it that recently in October of 2015, you can't believe this, the entire WHO, the entire World Health Organization, from countries all over the place, all over the world, came to an agreement that red meat had the same level of carcinogenicity as smoking cigarettes. How's that for unanimity? Yeah, and when you think about it, all these animals really uh, don't like to get involved from this standpoint, but uh, why would uh, why would humans want to have their stomach be the graveyard, the final graveyard of, of some animal? When you think about the enormous contribution that animals are making to the destruction of the planet with uh, many of the gases that they produce. So I guess the reason I, I find myself still <clears throat> so optimistic about really of the what is can be really the seismic revolution of health and within us before us the seismic revolution is going to come about not from the invention of another pill a stent or a bypass or a procedure the seismic revolution will come about when we in the profession have the will and the grit and the determination to show patients the lifestyle and most specifically the nutritional literacy mm -hmm. that will empower them as the locus of control 
to halt and annihilate chronic illness. Because it's not only cardiovascular disease that goes, it's diabetes, vascular dementia, strokes, heart attacks, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, multiple sclerosis, allergies, and asthma. I mean, medicine has never before had such an absolutely profoundly powerful tool in their toolbox as whole food plant-based nutrition. If there's any upcoming events, or like I said, I know uh, before COVID, you guys were um, hosting seminars, monthly uh, events. Um, if there's anything like that that you'd like to share, please feel free. Do the monthly seminar, if it's now virtual. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, and uh, I think RIP in September 18th has a seminar from the farm here uh, that we'll all be involved in. Wow. And that, that should be uh, pretty exciting.